Okay, welcome everybody to the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta video series Endgame class. Tuesday nights we have alternating Endgame class and great players of the past. Those lectures are in the past. Um, today's we'll focus on minor piece endgames. For those of you who don't know, which is about half of you, minor pieces are bishops and knights. Okay, and major pieces are rooks and queens. When I teach chess in schools, which I don't do anymore, um, this takes like eight weeks to explain. So like week seven, I'm like, you hung a minor piece, and they're like, what? So then I'm like, remember bishops and knights? And they're like, no. So, the Amy was in my class from Futurama. Okay, now, the first two are not positions I want to show you. I'm just setting things up to explain things to you. Then we'll get to the actual positions. This is actually a famous puzzle, but I don't care about that. What I care about is that you know the big difference between minor piece endgames and major piece endgames. Okay? Minor piece endgames, it's very unlikely you will win if you have no pawns. So you could be up one piece or even two pieces and you're still not going to win. Okay, and I'll show you the two-piece example during the lecture. Um, one of the famous examples, which you all know, is this, is this situation. This is called what? What do we call this kind of situation? A pass pawn. Oh, good yeah. enough. That's, that's partial credit. The wrong color push up. Well, I mean, sort of. That's also, you're getting closer. Wrong yeah, pawn? yeah, it's it's called the wrong colored rook pawn, but it's the wrong colored bishop too, I guess. Just half of one, yeah. Okay, um, so this pawn, if you promoted it, you would win. Well, some of you would, and that pawn promotes on a dark square. This bishop is not on a dark square. Okay, so the wrong colored bishop. So if you have a pawn that's on the A or the H file, Ginger GM's two favorite files. And your bishop does not control the promoting square, which it does not. That means if the king gets here, it's a draw. Now, I'll tell you a famous joke, although it's not a joke, but still it's funny. And then I'll, I'll show you the puzzle. So let's just play like normal people. Okay, just normal, you know, kind of stuff. Okay. And you can see that everything leads to stalemate. Okay, like this is stalemate and this is stalemate. And, and so forth, okay? And you're like, well, I'm not gonna stalemate him, okay? Black very simply moves his king back and forth. And most players know this already, even some beginning players, they know this is a draw. And black just plays king h8, king g8, and if black can't play king g8 or king g8, it's, it's stalemate, so it's a draw. Okay, now there's a grandmaster that I'm going to say, I don't want to say three, because I'm getting worried here. Three of you have heard of, named Roman Jinjahashvili. Raise your hand if you've heard of him. Roman Jinjahashvili, you were the one I wasn't sure about. Dang, I wanted to say two. The kids I knew was less than zero percent. Okay, Roman Jinjahashvili was one of the best American players for about 20 years. He's from Soviet Georgia, like we're in now, now that Trump's president. And... Um, he, he was sort of a funny guy. He, he likes me. I'm sort of funny. Okay, he's sort of funny. And he was a gambler. He's still alive, but barely. And he would make all kinds of chess bets. Okay, and one of his bets is he would show a position like this. That's any good chess player knows as a draw. Even a lot of bad chess players know as a draw. And he would say, I'll bet you money I can promote my pawn. And then they would bet him. And he would pretend that he couldn't promote his pawn. He was getting frustrated. And they would be laughing. And then eventually he would do this. And he would promote his pawn and say, pay me. Because he bet you he could promote his pawn. And he promoted his pawn. Mm -hmm. He didn't say he could win. He said he could promote his pawn. And he did. Okay. Now, now a lot of people, when I show them this puzzle, the puzzle is white to play and win. They raise their hand or they shout out, well, wait a minute. That's the wrong colored rook pawn, so you can't win. And then I argue, if the king was here, would you win? And they're like, yeah. And I said, well, it's still the wrong colored rook pawn. 
The reason it's a draw is if the king gets to the corner. So if the king is here or here or here or here, it's always a draw. If it's somewhere else, then you, you have to get to one of those four squares or you're not going to draw. Obviously, this is losing. Obviously, this is a draw. And then, you know, somewhere in here is a win or a draw depending on you know, the position. In this position, White's winning if he plays perfect every move. And I've shown this puzzle many times. Okay, I, want, I didn't want to show the puzzle. I'm just letting you know that if you have a losing or a worse position in a minor piece endgame, there's a lot of ways to draw. And one of them is to give your opponent the wrong colored rook pawn. And even though they have a bishop and a pawn and you have nothing, you still draw. Now this is a win because white can stop black from getting in there. White plays here. If black goes here, white plays there and it's already over. Black has to move away and then white queens. So black should play king e7. Black should play king here. This is the only winning move. You can't take the bishop because you promote. Now if we go here, we win. So you go here. And then king f4 and white wins. Because black can't go to any of these squares. And so eventually the truth hurts. Okay, and black, white's going to make a queen. And most of you can meet with the queen. So in positions where you have the wrong colored rook pawn and the king is in the corner, it's a draw. Sometimes I jokingly show white having all these pawns, five pawns. If white has five H pawns, very likely if you're watching my stream, otherwise not too likely. And the wrong colored, you know, the bishop, it's still a draw with the bishop and five pawns. Okay, another position that also defies logic is... Uh, this one. Okay. This is a game between Karpov and Korshnoi from World Championship match. Now, they played two World Championship matches, and they played a de facto World Championship match, but not de jure, obviously. Right? How's your Latin? Pretty good? Pretty, pretty good. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I say de facto but not de jure is obvious to anybody in the audience. And by that, I mean the adults. No? All right. Well, I'll ask you a key question. Which world champion didn't play his match and was thus forfeited? Alakai? No, that's not... It's not because he died. He refused to play the match. Hmm. Fisher. Fisher. Okay. Now, if Fisher didn't play his match and he was supposed to play, who didn't he play that he was supposed to play? Someone who's playing Spassky? Karpov. Karpov. Okay. The reason Karpov became world champion is the 1975 match did not take place. Fisher didn't play, so Karpov became the world champion. Now, therefore, now you get to my de facto, Karpov, the match before, because Fisher was never going to play, whoever won that match was going to become the world champion because they would play Fisher. Fisher wasn't going to play, and, and that was this match. Well, no, it wasn't this match. That was the 1974 match between Karpov and Korshnoi. Okay, and Karpov won that match, and then he became world champion because Fisher refused to play. Then, later on, when Karpov was actually the world champion, he played Korshnoi a match, and as you all know, they don't know. <laughs> the score was 5-2, to two, for Karpov, first to win six games. And then Korshnoi won three games out of four with a draw. So it's five to five. And then Karpov won and he won six to five. In game 32, obviously. Then the next match is this match where Karpov won easily six to two. It actually says the score up there, but maybe you can't read that. And when you're older, you learn how to read. Okay, now this was one of the games. This was a very boring game I believe it was the Joko Piano, even more boring, the Joko Pianissimo, okay? And it looked like they were going to agree to a draw, but Karpov's Karpov, okay? He looked at his driver's license, he's like, oh, I'm Karpov, okay? And, and Karpov, if you, if you don't believe me, 
you can ask them in this room in August. Oh, snap! Is that is Karen approved? We hope. In yeah. August. More than 50%? Yeah. I'll say 70. Yeah, if these kids heard of Carpod, they'd be impressed. Mm -hmm. So, you kids who haven't heard of him, the guy who's white in this game, this I game, know him. he's one of the five greatest players ever. He'll probably be in this room in August. Okay, what school did he go to? Um, baby. <laughs> no, old school. He's 68 now. He'll be 69 when he comes here. Okay, if he comes here and when he comes here. Okay, he's 69, so now you can beat him except for one thing. You can't beat him. Right. Okay, I mean, I could beat him in one minute, but that's about it. No now, way. pay attention. Now, in this game, it's obvious who's better, white. Because white's going to take this pawn, and then white's going to make a queen. Right? That, that pawn's not going to queen. Are you kidding me? This king is too close. You know, ridiculous. Okay, but remember what I said before. If you don't have any pawns, you're not going to win. So Korshnoi is like, hmm, let's get rid of the pawns. So after it came to d2, Karpov saving his pawn... Korshnoi played b4, and Karpov's like, yay, finally I'm up a pawn, and I'm going to make a queen. This is a very funny position. If white makes a queen, he wins, and if black takes that pawn at any cost, it's a draw at any cost. Okay, so it's sort of lucky, because you can't really calculate all the way to the end. you got to hope, right? Okay, so Korshnoi... Played knight there. He's going to go get that pawn. He plays his other knight there. Man, the white king is not helping very much, is it? Okay. Knight check. I said it was check. Knight here. So the pawn can never move because I'll take it. Even if it's protected, you can't win with just two knights. King there. Knight g7. Knight there. Knight f6. And then this is great. What, what Korshnei did was great. Just great. That's a pretty cool position, isn't it? Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. Knight f7 attacking the pawn. So you got to play h7. Knight there attacking the pawn. Now watch this. Now you the, the young people are going to like this, but the old people won't because tricks are for kids. White played the trickiest move. I'm going to bet on... Well, I was betting on Oliver. And then you raised your hand. Yeah, you. Um... Pawn to queen? No. Well, then, then I take it. <laughs> no. Oliver with the right answer. Knight e7 check. See, I'm not as dumb as I look, seem to be, or best testing indicates. Right? Knight e7 check. Bam! The idea is obvious to even the most dim-witted individual with an advanced degree in hyperbolic topology. And that is, we want to play your move here... But we don't want the guy to take it. So we're hoping he takes the knight and then we'll make a queen. See, that's a fork. Forking a king and a knight. And Korshnei, for the first time in history, it was 1981, said, whatever. It was the first time it was ever said. And he just moved his king. He's like, yeah, whatever, leave me alone. He moved his king where the white knights couldn't check it. Check it. Then he took the knight. And finally, Black played the most obvious move. Man, I'm afraid to call on you. You! Um, knight takes h7. Correct! You ever heard that word before? Do you know what it means? <laughs> yeah, it's the opposite of incorrect. Now he knows what it means. Right? Yeah. Then he's like, yeah, thanks. Knight takes h7. And even though White's up two pieces, he's not going to win. Now we're going to vote. There's six of you. I actually, I'm going to guess three to three. That's my guess. <laughs> can White legally win here? It's impossible. Can you construct a checkmate or you can't? Who says, yeah, White can checkmate. It's possible. Who says, no, it's impossible. Ridiculous. It was four to two. And the four people were wrong. Yeah. You can checkmate, but you won't. You can, but you won't. It's legally possible to do so. But that means your opponent's playing really bad, worse than you usually play. So they agreed to a draw. But let me show you how black can lose on purpose. What? You guys should be teaching me that. What? Okay. So in this position, really? 
If I'm trying to meet you, it's stalemate and such, right? If I could go here, it would be checkmate. But if I go anywhere else, it's stalemate. So here's, here's the way you can win. Watch, watch how you can win. Okay. So in this position, let's pretend I go check. You can lose if you want to. I wouldn't recommend it. You can play king here and lose. Then I got checkmate everywhere. I got two checkmates. Right? But you can't force a win. It's going to be a draw. Black's not going to lose on purpose. So they agree to a draw. So even though white's up two pieces, he can't win. That's what differentiates minor piece endgames from major piece endgames. When your opponent has two major pieces, you're going to lose. When they have two minor pieces, if they're knights, you won't lose. And if they have one piece extra, which sounds good, you're not going to lose if they have just a bishop or just a knight. Got to have two pieces. Now, the people in this room, if your opponent has a bishop and a knight, they're not going to beat you either. You know who is going to beat you? Me. But no, the other guys know. No way. Yeah, now you guys know. Yeah. No right. way. He didn't believe I'd win. That's how ridiculous it no, is. No, I yeah. would do a steal. Yeah, bishop and knight wins, but you have to know how to do it. Not your, well, not I your strong suit. Do it. Right. You learned it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I remember you learned it. I'd be one of your old students. Right. Now you're the best. How old are they? 70s, 80s? 40s. 50s. You call that an old student? No, oh, maybe. You're pretty young. Okay. <laughs> Now let's get to the actual lecture. We're going to look at three games. Two of them are from Fine Gold, and the third one's from Fine Gold, but not me. This is my game with Vichy Anand, your favorite grandmaster, five time world champion. This was the first time we met in 1986, and we got this position. This is a minor piece ending, and Black has several advantages. You with some crazy comment. Are you white or black? Yes. I, I'm white. You? Um, the same question. Well, I'm black. <laughs> the what only joke they found funny. All right, he's like, no, that's not funny. Are you white or black? I'm white in this position. Black. Now, here, black has a big advantage. There's pawns on both sides of the board, which usually means the bishop is better than the knight. And my king, as... as Anand said to me, can't do Vishwa nothing. His king's pretty good. His king can go there or take my knight. My king just sits there. Also, my pawns are all on dark squares, so his bishop can take all of them. So I'm losing. Or maybe I'm drawing, if I play well. Now, as we've discussed in many, 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 many lectures on endgames, many, the side that's probably losing or drawing, the side that's in trouble, which is white, does white want to trade pawns or keep all the pawns on the board? Trade pawns. Trade pawns. So let's say I can give up my two pawns for his one pawn. That'd be good for him. He's getting a pawn. But then all the pawns are on the king's side and his extra pawn's a doubled pawn. So that's probably a draw. Okay. So he moved his king over there, and I said, let's get all the pawns off the board. No more pawns. Okay? And I played a5. I said, no pawns. Okay? Now, in this position, you might say, whoa, what's wrong with you, Ben? You could have taken this, and then taken this, and I would say, don't call me Ben. Right? And then he would go here and here and here, and then he has a passed pawn. So that's no good. So I got here getting rid of the pawns. Black doesn't want to get rid of the pawns, and black doesn't want me to queen. So he took, and I took, and now if he takes my knight, this pawn queens. So what did he do? You. He took the pawn. He took the pawn. Now he's down a piece. But if you want to win minor piece endings, 99% of the time, you got to promote a pawn. You're not going to just mate him with your knight. That's not how it works. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you have a rook or a queen, you might mate your opponent. If you have a knight or a bishop, Ish don't think so. So black has the advantage because this pawn might queen, but that's it. My pawns can't queen. 
Is my king going to stop his pawn? Ugh. No. Man, I was 16, but I feel old. A king can't go that far. Okay. So we moved our kings over. And he went here. And then I blocked his pawn. Bam. Confusing the audience. Oh, yeah. Less confused. And now we agreed to a draw because after takes, I go here and then he has to stalemate himself. According to Nigel Short, white wins because I go here and I stalemate him. <laughs> All right. So he would push his pawns until he can't push them anymore. Stalemate. Okay, so we agreed to a draw there. So in that in that instance, I tried to get rid of my pawns, but Vichy's like, I want to make a queen, and then I stopped him from queening by getting my king over there. Otherwise, I would have lost. That was very lucky. Okay, so in an end game, you got to get past pawns, especially in minor piece end games, and often the way you win minor piece endings is you sacrifice a piece and then you have all these past pawns and your opponent has a knight or a bishop but that's not going to mate you but your past pawns when they become queens then I have to stop lecturing this is a minor piece on game lecture if your opponent makes a queen I gotta stop exactly okay this is one of my favorite games this was played in the last round of the world open before you were born this game is so old that even though Karen's older than me, it was before she was born. That's how the math works. Kids are like, wait, what? <laughs> okay, now, if you watch my stream every second of every day, what would I say about White's position? Come on, Karen, you watch all my streams. You. The two bishops, what else? Two bishops, what else? I have two bishops, eh, and he does not. Okay, he has bishop and knight. Two bishops is better than bishop and knight, which I will again prove in the next example. Also, my king's better than his. If you walk your king up the board, my king's on the fourth rank. His king's on the second rank. Now, the bad part is it's pretty boring. I, I'm not like getting a passed pawn, so I have to be patient and beat him like an old man. Luckily, even in 1993, I was an old man. I was always an old man, right? That's why my last name was changed. You guys don't know this. I used to be Benjamin Button, but I changed it to Feingold. So I used to be older. Not at, at home they get it, but you guys are like, what? No, sorry. Can I ever make a joke that they get? They laughed at something, remember? It wasn't funny. They were both laughing. Yeah. You're like, I don't remember that. Weren't you both laughing at some point? Yeah. I don't even know what I said, but you guys both laughed. Okay, mm -hmm. so my opponent attacked my pawn, and I had to break my rule, so don't look. Close your eyes. You! Never play F. Never play F. This was in 1993. I didn't know those rules then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Put it in H, trying to get space advantages on both sides of the board. Move my king up. Okay, now, Capablanca who three of you haven't heard of, but three of you have. He was the world champion from 1921 to 1927. And he said, you should advance your pawns where you have a majority. I don't have a majority. I got three against three and three against three. That's okay. I'm not Capablanca, so I can do what I want. Okay. And one thing you're going to do if you want to make a queen you don't need rules for this. I'll just tell you and you'll be like, well, of course. Is it more likely I'm going to queen on the side where my king is or the side where his king is? Your king. My king. If I push my pawns where his king is, his king's going to take my pawns. So I want to push my pawns on the queen side. That's where I'm going to make a queen. Okay. Because it's the queen side. Yeah. Because I trap his bishop a little. B4. He played h5. h5 follows what rule when you have a worse end game? What's he trying to do? Get all the pawns off. Get all the pawns off the board. Okay, that's h5 is h5 is good. Okay. B5. Okay, and he's like, yeah, I trade more pawns. 
And now I tricked him because tricks are for kids. Most people would play bishop takes b5 without thinking. One of your strong suits is not thinking. You do it every day, right? But I want to make a queen because I said so, right? Remember when I said I want to make a queen before the lecture, during the lecture, after the lecture? No. Of these three pawns, I have three pawns left. Which one is most likely to queen? Which is the closest? You. Um, the A-pawn. Right, why don't I just queen it now? What's stopping me? Um, the B-pawn. Right, so I played. You. Bishop E4. Bishop E4. Then when I take the B-pawn, then I'll queen. It's easy to defend his B-pawn, except it's not. You. So, the knight is stopping from getting the pawn up. Yeah, but when I take that, that knight's not doing so good, is it? Well, the knight can move to A7. Yeah, but I have a bishop and a king that can attack that, don't I? Like bishop B8? Man, your knight's trapped. Okay, so he played knight A7, trying to get out of there. Trying is the first step to failure. Bishop d5 check. See, if he doesn't play bishop e6, I'm just going to go take his knight. So he has to play bishop here so his knight can get out. And it did. What's the only move for him? Yeah. It's, it's knight, knight takes e6. No, knight, uh, knight takes a7. You don't like his move of not losing a knight? No. Now, now, one thing you should have noticed in the last five or ten moves, but you did not, and it was the first position I showed you. Now, when one side has only a, one bishop, their other bishop is gone. That happens in, like, almost all of your games. 95% of your games, at some point, one of your bishops is captured. Or you got made it before that, I move four. Okay, and in that case, you got to see what's on that collar, what's on the other collar, so your bishop can capture it. In this instance, it's an end game. When you have an end game, that's a minor piece ending, which they all are. When you have only a bishop, you got to check out those rook pawns. You see this rook pawn? Does my bishop control the queening square? Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, so if it turns out these are my only two pieces left, the bishop and this, I can still win. So if he sacrifices for this pawn, I'll win pretty easily. If it was the wrong colored pawn, all he'd have to do is take this one and he'd draw it. But he can't do that. So he has to play knight b6. Ugh. Okay. I played bishop g3. What's my next move? Why did I do that? That's actually a hard question. That's not easy. Why did I play bishop g3? You. To play f4? You're close. And by close, not too close. Yeah. Get back to your favorite word. Incorrect. <laughs> this was actually a good move because I was an old man then. Wait, I, I think I know. I think I know. Well, can I call Vegas and bet against it? You. I was bishop F2. Right, and here's the reason. Okay, if his king gets to B7, then his knight can go frolicking. His knight can do everything. <laughs> but if I attack his knight, he's got to play. Um, knight A8, just where you want your knight. Nope. One of the rules of... That was a joke, by the way. One of the rules of minor piece endings is knights don't like pawns on the side. Knights don't like that. The knight's got to go all the way to one side. That's not the most active knight ever. So now when I do this, that's going to be the most fun I ever had. Okay? okay so that's what I did. Rawr. Wait, are you black or white again? Still white. Dang. Okay. <laughs> Yay. Okay. And I attacked his knight. Right. Now I played a grandmaster move even though I wasn't a grandmaster at the time. Every move wins for white. I guarantee it. Wait, every move? Yeah. I wonder if bishop g1 wins. It might. 
Bishop G1 might win. Probably it doesn't. Close. Every move wins. Every reasonable move. But I played the move, and then he has to cry like a grandmaster. You! Bishop E3. Very good. Bam! Now his knight can't do... Vishwanathan. Vishwanathan. That's the most... Like that? His knight was here and it couldn't move? Now it's here and it can't move. When you're older, bishops are better than knights. When you're a little kid, your knight's forking things and your opponent doesn't see it. But then when you're old, you're like, wow, my bishop can go to a thousand squares and my knight can't move anywhere. Darn. <laughs> so after bishop e3, I have two winning plans. One is to take this pawn and make a queen. Then there's a funnier one that takes a lot longer, but it's much funnier. Okay, you go here. Oh. And the knight can escape except for one thing. It, it can't escape. Mm -hmm. That's a silly plan. Obviously, you could just take the pawn and go here. Or take the pawn and play king g6 and queen. But that's a funny one. His knight's not very good. Okay. So in that end game, there were pawns on both sides of the board. My bishops were better than his bishop and knight. My king was better than his king. But you got to keep some pawns on the board. Now, here I was lucky. I had two bishops. So if all the pawns disappeared, I could still win with two bishops, as long as he has nothing. But if he has a minor piece, then I can't win. Okay, last but not least is your two favorite players, Bobby Fischer and Feingold. That's you? No, it's my dad. Before I was born. Okay, and they got this position. This is a minor piece endgame. It's also two bishops against bishop and knight. It's also pawns on both sides of the board, but the pawn structure is a little suspicious. All the pawns are weak and isolated and weird, and both kings are on the first rank. Terrible. But white has... Two bishops. Two bishops. What else? Two bishops. Right. Okay. Now, let's see who's the oldest. You're the oldest, right? Maybe. Okay. How old was Bobby Fischer in 1963? Uh, um... 17, 16? Yeah. 20. Oh. Right? And at the end of 63, 63, 64, that's when he won the U.S. Championship 11-0. No Reasonable. Right? And now at the St. Louis Chess Club, which always has the U.S. Championship, they jokingly, I don't know if they know it's a joke. I think they do. Called the Singfield Prize. If you win all your games like Fisher did, Rex Singfield throws in an extra 64,000. I'll tell you what, and I said this on camera, if anybody wins all their games in the U.S. Championship, I'll throw in an extra 64,000. Because the chances are less than 0%. Right? I don't know if he knows that. I think he knows that. I think he does. Yeah. And usually in the U.S. Championship, nobody's 3-0 and anymore. Like, 2-0 and draw. Yeah, nobody, nobody, nobody's going 11-0. and Now, there's a reason for that. Fisher was obviously better than everybody else. But people are stronger now. The bottom five players in the U.S. Championship in 63 were suspicious. The bottom five players in the U.S. Championship now are pretty good. It's hard to win games in the U.S. Championship. Guys are all 2,700. So nobody's going to do that. Okay? You can do it in the women's, too. In the women's, it has been done, but not anymore. In the women's, there used to be all-American women. What would Hikaru say about all-American women? Frankly, terrible. And he was right. It used to be, this will even surprise Karen, used to be the highest rated woman in the U.S. women's was like 2,100. USCF. Crazy. Yeah. So then when Irina Crush was 2,400 strength, she won the U.S. women's 901s. At least once. Now she gets 4.5 out of 9 because it's stronger now. Those women are born in the U.S. Those women are tough. Okay. When they were born in the U.S., they, they weren't as tough. Now... I actually don't, oh, I remember her name now. Should I say her name? Yeah, why not? Abby Marshall was a fine junior player, and she was 2200 USCF. And she played in the US Women's. And her name's Abby Marshall, so she's born in America. Okay? Not good. There's good and there's not good. She got half a point. Okay? And she's 2200. If she had played 30 years earlier, she would have been the number one player. So the things change. And now, yeah. Now, Carissa Yip's pretty good. Zatonsky, Crush, Jennifer Yu, etc. Mainly, etc. Okay, so Fisher was pretty good in-game player. Now, 
my dad told me a story. He said, when he found out he was playing Fisher, somebody told him, Fisher's bad at the end game. So he said, okay. And then he said, that's why I decided to play the French defense. I'm not sure how that's related to Fisher being bad at the end game, playing the French defense. I don't, I don't, I don't get how that's related. All right. So my dad did play the French defense, and they got to this ending, which is in many books, as Fisher played like a genius. So I guess he wasn't a bad in game player. Okay, so F6, never do that. And they move their kings up, as was the style at the time. Okay, and in this position, Fisher played Bish takes D6 check, confusing the audience. The audience was my dad. And when my dad played B5, he was shocked Fisher played this. Never give up the two bishops. So my dad was like, what? And my dad thought, and other people thought, if he didn't play b5, he wouldn't be losing. I disagree. I think with perfect play, probably white's winning anyway, probably. Now you can see the knight's defending the pawn, so you can't take the pawn. So Fisher removed the defender. But that doesn't win a pawn right away, because after king takes, Fisher's pawn is attacked. So Fisher defended it. Now we have a bishop ending. And this is one thing I wanted to talk about during the lecture. There's two kinds of bishop endings. Same color, which you see here. And opposite color, which has a lot of drawing chances. In fact, if I moved one of the bishops to the other color, it would be a draw. If I put this here, or I put this here, this, that, that would be a draw in endgame. Opposite colored bishops, it's hard to win because a lot of times you can be down one or two pawns and still draw. In this instance, four of the pawns are rook pawns, so wrong colored rook pawn, you got to watch out for that. Okay, but we have an immediate threat here. Bishop takes b5. Now the reason white's winning, <clears throat> this king's on the fourth rank, this king's on the third rank, so that's better for white. And more importantly, and confusing the audience, are these two pawns. Which one of those pawns is more likely to queen? Oh. Exactly. Yeah, that one. Yeah. The h6 pawn, that's pretty close to queening. This pawn, that, that, that pawn's not, not going to queen. <laughs> okay. So, okay, my dad has to take care of this pawn. So he did. Now he's got to take care of it again. Also, c5 looks pretty annoying. So he takes, obviously. Now he's got to take care of this pawn. Man, Harsh Fisher's tough. Okay, bishop a2, and now my dad has to move. But my dad doesn't want to move. Unlike you guys, when I say you guys, I mean only half of you. Fisher knows the en passant rule. So if my dad plays c5 check, and Fisher takes en passant, then he's going to lose this pawn eventually. I'm just going to go take it. So you can't move the C pawn or the E pawn or the A. can't move anything. So my dad played F5, trading more pawns, because when you're losing, you trade pawns. Now in this position, Fisher has a famous blunder that he did not make. If he did make it, he would have lost. But he didn't make it because it's silly. For you guys, it's not silly. For My dad thought he was about the fifth best player in the world in 63. That he wouldn't make this kind of blunder. The most obvious move for white is bishop b1, always retreat. And this pawn is indefensible. Looks good for white. And now, shocking half of the audience, black's now winning. What's the winning move for black? Um, e3. E3. Notice how we're threatening the bishop because I said so. So you take, and then e2. Oh, snap, you don't have to take. Well, you could be down a piece and lose. The point is e2 and you queen. In minor piece endings, if you queen, that's good. I'll let you guys take notes at home. Okay, so Fisher didn't play bishop b1 because that's silly. He played bishop b3, and he said, aha, black has no legal moves. And my dad said, sure I can. Here, 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 here. Otherwise, you can't really do anything. So he did that, okay? And Fisher said, ha-ha, I won't let you play bishop g6 anymore. Fisher played. You. Um, 
Bishop D7. <laughs> Man, that was more incorrect than usual. That was pretty incorrect. The first time you raised your hand. Wow. Bishop E8. Bishop E8. Bam. And he said, gotcha. Okay, now, there's a word you never heard of. That means they've heard of it. Called yeah. Zugzwang. Oh, I heard Yeah, yeah. I heard of it's that. Black's move, but Black can't move. All moves are bad. Uh, now, you guys are kids. You don't believe that. So suggest a good move for Black. There is no good move. There's not. I know. I know right. there is. Can't move. There isn't. So that's why Fisher traded the bishop for the knight. His bishop's the better bishop. His king's the better king. And this pawn is pretty close to queening. It gets even closer later. Now, my dad had an idea. He said, I'll attack the bishop. The bishop's going to move away. Then I'll go back to d6. Pretty, pretty good idea. But, that but Fisher didn't move his bishop. That's shocking. What did he play? Um, King e5. King e5. If you trade bishops, which didn't happen, that's, that's not good for black. There's good and there's not good. That's not good. Okay, that's the worst king upon any ever. Man, harsh. Okay, so my dad played, saved his bishop, bishop g4, and now Fisher played a move the tacticians in the room will like. Who's the tactician in the room? Well, you. What? What? Huh? Wait, what? what? Now remember what I taught you. They, they don't remember. How do you win minor piece endings? You make a queen. Yeah. Which pawn is closest to being a queen? Now make it a queen. Don't be a baby. Just do it. You, you're not a baby. Close. Bishop G6. Bishop G6. Bam. Bam. Oh, snap. Bam. You can't take the bishop for obvious reasons. So you have to not take the bishop. Then white just mops up. Takes all the pawns. That's not nice. So better bishop, better pawns, better king. What's that commercial where he says better this, better than they say anything? Papa, Papa John's, yeah. Better everything. Man. And the most insane CEO who ever lived. Well, they was fired and then some, right? Okay. Man, that guy makes Trump not look so insane. Remember he said he ate 40 pizzas in a month? Remember that? You can't make that up. Right? You remember that? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The guy who was the CEO of Papa John's, he was let go by the company, then he went crazy. It's crazy before that. But yeah. Okay. And then Fisher was crazy. Yeah. Okay. So my dad made some legal move and Fisher took all of his bonds. It wasn't very nice. Man, harsh. All right. And then Black resigned for obvious reasons. I don't know what the reasons were, but they're pretty obvious. Yeah. So in that ending, White took one advantage for another. He traded his bishop for the knight. So he can attack the weak pawns and advance his king. Confusing my dad, who was like, Bishop takes knight. What? The two bishops. How could you do that? And that's a very well-known idea for stronger players, is transitioning of one advantage to another. You have a mating attack. The guy stops your mating attack. But in doing so, it loses two pawns to a lost ending. But you're not worried about that because you're getting mated. Then when you get to the lost ending, you're like, dang, I'm in a lost ending. So that didn't happen here. That was the two bishops. White had a better king, better pawn structure. And by trading, things worked out even better for him. That's the very famous ending. And they, they told my dad he was bad in the end game. Man, that was terrible. Right? So he showed him and so forth. Now, the last story I'll tell, in 1989? I think it was 89. I played Judith Polgar at Sherman in Amsterdam, and they didn't have all these laptops then, but she had printouts. So she printed out the game she could find of mine to prepare for me. When our game ended, she said, hey, what's this? She showed me this printout, and it was this. And I said, that's my dad. She said, oh. She was wondering how I played in 1963, since I was like a teenager in 19, you know, I was like, what, what happened? 
Yeah. And I said, that wasn't me. That was somebody else. Yeah. Now, she should know better. Because Polgar, there's like 20 Polgars. Come on. Just because it says Polgar doesn't mean it's her. Now, come on. You kidding me? Thanks for watching the Minor Peace Endgame Lecture. That was no minor lecture. There are a lot of miners in here, though. Right? Yeah, you guys shouldn't go underground so much. Get a cough and stuff. This is Grandmaster Ben Feingold at the Chess Club in Scholastic Center of Atlanta. Like and subscribe. And don't forget to watch more of our lectures and buy our merch. Do as I say. Bye, everyone. You can clap now.